This is the second part in my 1970s Killers and Cults series. The first video was on Charles Manson and those associated with him. If you haven't checked that one out, I'll link it at the end of this video in the closing card. This video is on cult leader Jim Jones and the Jonestown Massacre in Guyana and was the largest loss of American civilian life until 9-11. The fallout from this event would lead to increased interest in cults and led to the expression, drink the Kool-Aid. Jim Jones, a minister and mass murderer, was the leader of a religious cult called the People's Temple that he formed in Indianapolis, Indiana. Jones was born James Warren Jones on May 13, 1931, in Crete, Indiana, during the Depression, the only child of Lynetta Putnam and James Thurman Jones. Jones' father, a road construction worker, was stationed in France during World War I, returning with lungs damaged by mustard gas. Disabled, with only a second-grade education in Depression-era America, Jim Sr. had a tough time finding work. Joan's mother, Lynetta, was an ambitious dreamer and never had any intention of marrying, never mind having kids. Her main goal in life was to be a successful businesswoman. She attended Lockyer Business College in Evansville, Indiana, but ended up cash-strapped after the death of her mother from typhoid fever and ended up dropping out. Lynetta went on to marry Jim Sr., a man 16 years older than her. She ended up being the primary breadwinner since Jim Sr., being disabled, was unemployed most of the time and his only source of income was from the government. Jones grew up in the small town of Lynn, Indiana, and having no siblings, spent much of his time alone. His father's poor health didn't lend itself to a lot of father-son activities, and his mother worked all the time to make ends meet, so she didn't spend a lot of time with him either. With Lynetta absent at work and Jim Sr. splitting his time between the VA hospital and the pool hall, Jones became close to a neighbor, Myrtle Kennedy. Kennedy disapproved of Jim Sr. and Lynetta's lifestyle. Between Lynetta's drinking and potty mouth and Jim Sr. camping out at the pool hall with his buddies, Kennedy didn't feel that this situation was the best environment for a four-year-old boy. Kennedy and her husband took Jones to Sunday school, as his parents never attended. While all the other kids' parents attended school events and Sunday school with them, Mrs. Kennedy filled that role for Jones. This made him feel that he was different from the other kids. Myrtle Kennedy would end up being one of the most important people in Jones' life. Jones became interested in preaching at an early age and was constantly warning his classmates to repent. As you can imagine, this made him a bit of an outsider as he didn't even try to fit in with the other kids. Studious and a loner, he was also a bully, so his classmates tried to avoid him like the plague. He would perform funeral services for dead animals and try to bully his classmates to come to the services. Supposedly, one of the animals he used in one of his funeral services, he killed himself. The people that he grew up with said that he was obsessed with religion and death. Toward the end, this would prove to be pretty accurate with his initiation of something called White Nights. Jones continued to search for the perfect religious experience, one in which he felt he could feel a sense of belonging. He attended several churches, Methodist, Disciples of Christ, Church of the Nazarene, Quaker, and even one where people spoke in tongues. His favorite was the Gospel Tabernacle Church, a Pentecostal church where he experienced a feeling of warmth and inclusiveness. The residents of Lynn viewed the Pentecostals somewhat as a group of rejects, something that Jones himself could identify with. He continued to preach in the streets, decked out in robes for maximum effect. At one point, he even stopped a pickup basketball game of neighborhood boys so that they could read the Bible together. 
you can imagine how this went down. Not a great way of making friends and influencing people. After a while, Jones figured out that going more mainstream in actions as well as dress would help his cause more, at which point he traded in robes for street clothes. When he was a senior in high school, Jones moved to Richmond, Indiana in 1946 to take a job as an orderly at Reed Hospital. There he met Marceline Baldwin, who was finishing up her nurse's training, and they were married on June 12, 1949. Marceline worked as a nurse at Reed while Jim attended law school. After a time, Jones dropped out of law school and worked a series of jobs until finally in 1952, accepting a position as student pastor at Somerset Methodist Church in Indianapolis. At first, Jim Jones' ministry was founded on egalitarianism with his mission to help the poor and the needy. During his time in Indianapolis, he became more and more troubled by the racism and inequities he observed around him. He launched a campaign to raise $20,000 to build a community center for all faiths, which earned him a write-up in the local paper. His dream was to completely integrate his congregation. He also spent more time at the local Pentecostal churches studying their healing services. As Jones began to practice religious healing, he found that he had a gift for holding the attention of groups of people and attracting them to his sermons. He also started collecting notes on the people that he was supposedly healing. His healings attracted more people to his services, thus increasing the numbers in his congregation. So he continued with these types of services. In the evolution of Jim Jones, the ends started to justify the means. Jones spoke at various Pentecostal churches, and by 1953, he was preaching at the Laurel Street Tabernacle in Indianapolis. By 1955, he began to travel and speak at other churches, and eventually started to practice and preach spiritual healing. His spiritual healing had progressed from simple power of suggestion and data collection to tumor extraction by palming animal parts and passing them off as tumors. For a while, it looked like Jones was set to take over the Laurel Street Church, but after the retirement of Laurel's aging pastor, the church board voted not to hire him because of his aggressive recruitment of black people. In response, Jones left Laurel and took half of the Laurel Street Tabernacle congregation with him. That decision led Jones to establish the People's Temple, which grew in size because of the integration of his congregation and the popularity of his healing revival performances, leading people to believe that he had supernatural powers. He also traveled to other churches for exchange services, which in reality were recruiting missions. Jones wanted his church to exemplify egalitarianism, shelter the needy, feed the hungry, and provide a semblance of family so that people wouldn't be lonely. He went so far as to command his congregation to wear casual clothes so that poor people wouldn't feel out of place. He demanded more and more from his followers, causing some to drop out, but those remaining became more tight-knit even choosing to spend the holidays with their church family rather than their biological family. Slowly, people in the congregation started to hand over their possessions in exchange for the church meeting all of their needs. Needless to say, the most idealistic and impressionable people were drawn to the People's Temple and Jones. The congregation of the People's Temple ended up giving up their individualism, in essence, their lives to be guided by Jim Jones and the church. Jones eventually started moving his congregation toward communism and Marxism under the banner of Christian communalism. He became interested in the teachings of Father Divine, a former handyman named George Baker, who was deemed to be of unsound mind by the Georgia courts and proclaimed himself Dean of the Universe. Jones not only wanted to model himself after Divine, but to succeed him, as Divine was not exactly a spring chicken. 
Unfortunately for Jones, Mrs. Devine would have something to say about that in the end. Even though Jones was unsuccessful in his venture, he would eventually claim that he himself was a manifestation of God. Jones continued his move to integrate churches and businesses in Indianapolis and spent his time going around town looking for any transgression to report to the newspapers. Businesses in Richmond started complaining to the city that Jones was harassing them. He started getting threats from the community, which included threatening phone calls, vandalism, bomb threats, and so on. It turns out that some of the threats were real, but most had been set up by Jones himself, using the leaders of his congregation. One day, Jones, in his sermon, claimed that he had a vision, a prophecy, that a terrible catastrophe was about to happen, and that Indianapolis would be attacked. Jones, believing he was under siege and that his finances were under investigation from the IRS, started planning to leave Indianapolis. This would be the first hint that Jones was suffering from increasing paranoia. The new site was Ukiah, California, a rural community 115 miles from San Francisco. In 1961, to avoid the catastrophe Jones claimed to see in his vision, he moved his congregation to Ukiah, a small rural community in California. While in California, his mental deterioration continued. Operating on little sleep, he began using amphetamines to keep himself awake. His paranoia increasing, he used fear of a coming apocalypse to keep his followers in line. His followers, now buying into his social evangelism and healing hoaxes, were under his complete control and were following him and his teachings without question. After settling in Ukiah, Jones continued to recruit more followers. His California recruits were people who had little education and people who had lived hard lives. In other words, people who were amenable to promises of a better life the largest number coming from the black neighborhoods of San Francisco and Los Angeles. Jones kept a mostly white leadership with his main congregation being 70% African American. Apparently, Jones was on board with the integration of his church as long as it didn't apply to his inner circle. Jones moved his family to the Temple Building in San Francisco. This would end up being the U.S. headquarters for the People's Temple when Jones left for Guyana. In San Francisco, politicians and black leaders were paying close attention to Jones' racially mixed congregation. Elected leaders such as San Francisco Mayor George Moscone visited Jones and used his followers as campaign workers. Jones even ended up being appointed to the San Francisco Housing Authority. In San Francisco, his celebrity kept growing. His closest advisors kept the miracles coming by collecting data on every member of the church. This circle of advisors not only had information about how the temple was run, but about Jones himself, which made them valuable not only to the temple, but made it necessary to keep them from defecting and taking the temple dirt with them. What did these insiders know? Jones' inner circle gathered intel to enable him to perform his miracles. They would go through trash, collecting social security numbers, pay stubs, and medical records. Any kind of information that would make the person that was healed believe that Jones was an actual miracle worker. As Jones became more and more narcissistic and enamored with his own power, he began cheating on his wife Marceline with members of his congregation. One of his lovers, Carolyn Layton, the wife of Larry Layton, was a member of his inner circle. After Larry divorced Carolyn and remarried, Jones even started an affair with Larry's second wife. Marceline Jones knew about her husband's philandering and considered divorcing him several times, but didn't want to endure the stigma of divorce. She was also a true believer in him as the leader of a movement and believed this was the price she had to pay. By the time she was ready to take the plunge, Jones threatened to keep her children from her. In the end, she became one of his biggest enablers. 
Certain members of his inner circle took care of the finances, so the rank and file of the congregation didn't actually know where their assets were going. They would turn over their paychecks to the church and in return would get an allowance to live on. The outside community viewed church members as being poor and didn't realize the actual value of the temple assets. Jones looked upon himself as some kind of a rock star, and his views when it came to his own sexual desires didn't quite mesh with what he told his congregation. He swung back and forth between telling his followers to abstain from sex to telling them they should just love everyone. One function of the temple hierarchy was to approve marriages, so the congregation didn't really have the freedom to choose who they were going to marry. Members of the congregation had started calling him father. They weren't being ironic. Jones' inner circle justified the cover-up of all these goings-on by telling themselves that the ends justified the means and that the end goal was the advancement of the temple. The inner circle was mostly white and educated and were looked upon by the rest of the congregation as elitists who thought they were better than everybody else. The change in scenery to Ukiah didn't solve all of the temple's problems. One of the teachers at the school that temple children attended noticed some things that bothered her. Even though the kids worked hard, one student wanted her B in English changed to an A because she said she didn't want to be whipped in front of the church. The children were exhausted from their weekend religious bus trips and claimed that they traveled in luggage racks of the bus due to lack of space. When some kids showed up scratched and bruised and were asked what happened, school officials were told that during a survival drill, they were dumped out in the middle of nowhere and told to find their way home. Asked about this, Jones denied it, but added this to his list of people that were out to get him. It wasn't long before the temple started to look like an armed camp. Temple members would take down license plates of cars parked due near the property. Church members would start tailing people that drove past the church late at night, and people walking by would set off the alarm system of the church. Well, you get the idea. Needless to say, the locals became more than a little concerned. The church started to receive threatening phone calls as well as verbal harassment and some vandalism. Then one day, a shot rang out and Jones fell to the ground, bleeding from the chest. He was helped inside and after a while emerged miraculously cured. His lieutenants had helped with the ruse of miracle healing. This was actually a setup by Jones and his inner circle to make people believe that he was the victim of an assassination attempt. Jones' followers became more and more cemented into the temple cult. Security was increased after this so-called assassination attempt, and temple members were armed. Security people were even disguised to look like Jones. It's almost as if Jones started to believe the incidents he faked were very real. Jones' rising fame and power didn't go unnoticed, and unfortunately for Jones, especially by the press. San Francisco Examiner religion editor Lester Kinsolving began looking into goings-on at the temple. His expose ran in a series of installments and set the congregation into a tizzy. And so started the drip, drip, drip of unflattering publicity. Jones began to be more and more suspicious of the press. On top of that, there were an increasing number of defections from the congregation. All of these things would lead him needing to exert more control over his followers. He had his closest confidants tailed by private investigators. This under siege mentality would lead to the departure of Jones and his congregation to Guyana. Before we discuss the People's Temple move to Guyana, it may be a good idea to take a look at Guyana, as well as the places in the country that are important to know. This may save some confusion later on in the video. Guyana is a small country located in South America, flanked by Venezuela and Suriname, with Brazil to the south. The capital of Guyana is Georgetown. 
Georgetown was the People's Temple headquarters located in the Georgetown neighborhood of Lamaha Gardens. A small contingent of People's Temple followers were stationed there, as well as people traveling back and forth from Jonestown. Port Kaituma is a small village located seven miles from Jonestown. It was at the Port Kaituma airstrip that Congressman Ryan's delegation to Jonestown was ambushed. Jonestown was the main settlement of the People's Temple and the place where the congregation lived, as well as Jim Jones, his aides, and his family. The congregation lived in a collection of small cottages and dormitories, while Jones lived in the main house with his aides. His wife, Marceline, lived in a separate cottage by herself. By 1973, Jim Jones and attorney Tim Stowen made plans to leave the country and zeroed in on Guyana. Why? Guyana was an undeveloped, socialistic country and predominantly English-speaking. Jones envisioned being able to exert his influence over his congregation with little interference from the Guyanese government. After land lease negotiations were completed, Jones was ready for the big move, ready to make a fresh start. Jones told his followers that they were moving to a Caribbean paradise where food was plentiful, perfect for farming, and the weather was perfect year-round. He didn't tell them the truth, that they were moving to a tropical rainforest with poor soil during the rainy season. There were no sandy white beaches. He didn't tell them that they would be doing hard physical work clearing trees. So what happened when Jones and his followers arrived in Guyana? Did they achieve the utopian paradise that they were seeking and that Jim Jones was preaching? In December of 1974, the first group of settlers arrived in Guyana to set up what would become Jonestown. Promotional videos were filmed for public consumption. Since there was no fruit on the trees, fruit was brought in and passed off as fruit that was grown there. At the time, Jones was splitting his time between San Francisco and Guyana. The first settlers that arrived lived in Georgetown for a while, since obviously there was no housing in that area that was to eventually become Jonestown. By 1975, they had moved permanently to Jonestown and slept in a building next to the banana shed. The new arrivals started clearing land, constructing buildings, and planting crops. At first, they would be helped by natives, who were paid $6 a day, until cost-cutting by Jones caused the native workers to be released. Machinery requested by the new settlers would arrive in broken-down condition, and some equipment was nothing more than junk. This was sometimes the result of Jones meddling, as he would order equipment shipped to California to Jonestown before it was rebuilt. There were also shortages of fuel and lack of funds. Despite these hardships, the small group of new settlers were relatively happy. Jones visited the settlement in 1976 only twice, and the settlers could pretty much run things the way they wanted without interference from father. The rank and file of the congregation started moving from San Francisco in May of 1977. The migration of new settlers picked up speed in June, July, and August of that year. The departure plans from the San Francisco Temple were veiled in secrecy, with Temple members telling relatives that they were going on vacation. Buses loaded with optimistic People's Temple followers left San Francisco in the middle of the night, heading to the East Coast to board flights headed to South America. At the start of 1977, Jonestown had 50 settlers. By May of 1977, there were 600, followed by 400 more. Jones moved to Guyana permanently in 1977, just as New West Magazine was preparing to publish abuse allegations from defectors against Jones and the Temple. Unfortunately, things continued to go downhill after Jones arrived in Guyana from San Francisco to stay permanently. Housing construction had not kept up with the rapid influx of new people, and conditions became overcrowded. Jones' answer to the problem was just to make room. Of course, he never had to worry about this, 
as he had a house to himself for him and his family. The new arrivals were for the most part unskilled and had to be trained, which slowed down the progress of the settlement. On top of that, it didn't take the newcomers too long to figure out that this wasn't the promised land that Jones had promised them. Undaunted, Jones continued his propaganda spiel, taking over the shortwave radio, telling his people back in San Francisco about the Eden that awaited them. He also knew that the San Francisco press, as well as the authorities, would be monitoring communications. By the time he arrived in Guyana, Jones had a serious drug problem, which caused him to become more and more paranoid. He became convinced that the Treasury Department, as well as the FBI, were after him, and he feared the news media. As I'm not a psychologist, it's hard to know whether his mental instability was increased by his drug use or if he would have gone off the deep end anyway. Jones had never formed the socialist government of his dreams, the one that he preached while he was in the United States. The governmental structure in Guyana was centralized, with Jim Jones being judge, jury, and executioner. He made it so that his followers couldn't live without him. The only communication the temple members had with the outside world were from Jones, where he read broadcasts from Radio Moscow and Radio Havana. On these broadcasts, Jones continued to portray the United States as an imperialistic villain. The residents of Jonestown worked six days a week with Sundays off, working from sunup to sundown in the hot sun. Jonestown resembled more of a jungle work camp than a paradise. Jonestown had poor soil, so crops the commune planned on growing had to be imported, making food limited. This didn't stop Jones, his family, and some members of his inner circle from having access to all the food they wanted. Jim Jones had his people right where he wanted them, isolated in another country where the law of the land was what he wanted it to be. All news from the outside world was filtered through him, as he and his inner circle were the ones with access to the radio. Unknown to the rank and file, there was a cache of guns stored on site. Jones' own son, Stephen, didn't know about the guns until Jones pulled out a three fifty six Magnum revolver and shot at a banana tree. Jones was not above setting up fake attacks from so-called militant invaders to keep his followers on edge and believing they were under siege from the outside world. Speaking out about temple conditions could be hazardous to say the least. Complainers were taken to something called an extended care unit and put on coma-inducing drugs. Children who cried about wanting to go back to the United States were lowered into a dark well at night. The idea of mass suicide wasn't something that came to Jones in some kind of vision during the night. In 1973, he first brought up the idea of mass suicide and in his plan everyone would die, but he would stay behind so he could explain the reasoning for the suicides. A member of his inner circle, Jack Beam, talked him out of that gem of a plan and argued that if everyone would die, Jones as leader should die with them. He brought up the plan again in 1976, while he was still in California, as investigations of the temple increased. At one planning meeting, he served his inner circle glasses of wine, and then informed them that the wine had been poisoned, in order to protest the inhumanity of the world. Anyone who tried to escape would be shot. They would all die together. No one even questioned this, or asked for an antidote or a doctor. Only one person, Patty Cartmel, dashed for the door. She was shot by a security officer, Mike Prokes. This turned out to be a twisted loyalty test, and Prokes, who was in on it, was firing blanks. Cartmel had failed the test. These loyalty tests would later be called White Knight Drills. In Guyana, these White Knight Drills continued. At first, these drills were supposedly for self-protection, Jones would scream, alert, 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 that the public address system and the entire community would gather at the central pavilion. Armed guards would surround the pavilion 
and men with rifles would be dispatched into the jungle to search for so-called invaders. By 1978, the tone of these white knight drills had shifted from self-defense to self-destruction. Mass suicides, a different version of the white knight drills, were rehearsed, this time with the whole congregation. Jones would announce that they were going to poison themselves. Punch would be brought out and was supposedly poisoned, and they were ordered to drink it. Some in the congregation would drink and keel over, but these were people that were planted among the congregation, and the bad acting didn't fool anyone. Jones would continue to claim that people from outside of Jonestown were sending snipers that were trying to assassinate him. The guy in his army was going to attack the settlement, and that babies were going to be taken away and tortured. Jonestown continued to deteriorate because of all the time spent on the white night drills and endless meetings listening to Jones ramble on from his perch at the pavilion. Buildings were in disrepair and were overcrowded, and the camp was overgrown with weeds. But if you were to look inside Jim Jones' house, you would see the biggest house in Jonestown, with two bedrooms and a screen porch. Jones had his own bedroom while his mistresses occupied the other. And what about his wife Marceline? She had her own cottage. Jones' bedroom had a large four-poster bed with drawers underneath for his clothing. Wooden trunks held items such as hypodermic needles, alcohol swabs, morphine, valium, laxatives, Maalox, hairspray, and Miss Clairol to keep his hair black. In some meetings, Jones would tell his congregation that he had spies among them and would single out individual members for verbal and sometimes physical abuse. Punishments were meted out arbitrarily. Those who incurred Jones' wrath could face being placed in a four-by-four-foot isolation box. His drug use was increasing, and he was becoming more and more irrational. By the end of 1977, he would be on the loudspeaker for hours talking about his doomsday predictions. Jones' wife, Marceline, served as peacemaker between Jones and everyone else, trying to control a volatile situation. Debbie Blakey, Jonestown's assistant financial secretary, had reached the point where she could take no more. Since she was on the finance team, she split her time between Jonestown and Georgetown. By May of 1978, she was starting to have second thoughts about Jonestown. On May 13th, she vanished and was spotted with an embassy police officer by Temple member Debbie Touche and informed her that she had pretty much had it and was leaving. Since Blakey understood the international banking system, she was a valuable asset to Jim Jones, so this development was not to be taken lightly. Terry Carter Jones tailed Blakey to the airport and hid among the passengers as Blakey was trying to board a TWA flight back to San Francisco. Carter blocked Blakey's path when she tried to board the plane and asked her why she was doing this to Jim. Not falling for that guilt trip, Blakey boarded the flight with a member of the U.S. consulate. Meanwhile, in Jonestown, the Blakey defection triggered the alert for another white night. Jones had gathered his staff to discuss how they could commit a mass suicide before Blakey could spill any damaging information and cause what Jones believed would be an invasion. Jones, like a ruling monarch, then sat in his chair at the pavilion, looking over a thousand people, while an assistant explained the situation. With some saying, let's do it now, and others, not yet, Jones ended the white night meeting. Unfortunately, many of Jones' followers had not yet figured out that the emperor had no clothes and wouldn't figure it out until it was too late. Jones may not have called for mass suicide, or as he called it, revolutionary suicide yet, but he did take action in the wake of the Blakey defection. He had two of his staff change the numbers on all the bank accounts and move some money to new ones. The Blakey defection was followed by Terry Buford in October of 1978. 
Buford, a financial strategist that aided Blakey, was no minor defection. She had come to realize that Jones had become a dictatorial tyrant and that his grip on reality was tenuous at best. Buford somehow got a transfer from Guyana to San Francisco and never came back. Jim Jones looked at defections, even if it was only one, as a huge failure and would dwell on each one. Each defection was caused to press the panic button, increasing Jones' belief that the temple was under siege from the outside world. However, the defections weren't the only things that added to Jones' paranoia. An additional problem for Jones was what was brewing in the States. In the fall of 1977, People's Temple defectors and the families of Temple members formed a concerned relatives group because they had family members in Jonestown who were not permitted to leave. In January of 1978, former Temple member Tim Stowen went to visit with members of Congress and explained his grievances against Jones. His efforts got the attention of Congressman Leo Ryan, who wrote a letter to Forbes Burnham, the Guyanese Prime Minister. In April of 1978, Concerned Relatives leaders Steve Katsaras and Howard Oliver assembled outside the People's Temple in San Francisco and delivered a petition of human rights violations. Of course, the San Francisco Temple communicated all of these events to Jonestown. The American consul, Dick McCoy, was taking heat from all sides, the public relations team from the People's Temple, and the Concerned Relatives Group. In early 1978, the Jonestown Public Relations people, consisting of Sharon Amos and Debbie Touche, met with Soviet official Theodore Timofeyev to discuss the possibility of relocating from Jonestown to the Soviet Union. After learning more about the People's Temple, Mr. Timofeyev found the idea more than a little unattractive. He found it even more unattractive when an offhand comment from DCM of the American Embassy in Jonestown, Richard Dwyer, made an offhand comment about the temple moving to the USSR, something that Timofeyev wanted kept under wraps. The door was slammed shut on the whole idea, as Timofeyev thought the public relations people had been shooting off their mouth too much. Jones, however, took this to the next level, by morphing a comment by an embassy official into a massive CIA infiltration operation. As time passed, Jim Jones' illnesses, both real and imagined, as well as his drug use, were increasing. He became a recluse and didn't bother to do any physical labor, leaving it to his minions. He would be too sick to chair meetings, thus would relay the information to the radio room from his house phone. He had others on his staff conduct meetings that were at the pavilion. When Jones would put in an appearance, he would slur his words and sometimes couldn't hold his train of thought. The drugs that he had been taking now included injectable Valium, barbiturates, quaaludes, and uppers. Speaking of Jim Jones' train of thought, a letter he sent to President Jimmy Carter and Secretary of State Cyrus Vance would have convinced anyone that Jones was losing touch with reality. In the letter marked urgent, 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 Jones claimed that enemies at the State Department and temple defectors were plotting to destroy the temple and take all their money. After that, these same defectors were going to blow up bridges and poison the water in Washington, D.C. No word on what President Carter thought of all this. It's not that it hadn't occurred to anyone to remove Jones. It had. His own son, Stephen, had entertained the idea of doing so, but knew that seizing power wouldn't go over well with Jones' loyalists. At the age of 18, and with little hope of convincing his mother to help him, he adopted a wait-and-see attitude. He knew his father was in poor health and hoped to take over when Jones died. Jones' sons escaped from the daily chaos by forming a basketball team. They made arrangements to play in a tournament against the Guyana national team in Georgetown. The timing of the tournament would turn out to be the day of Jim Jones' final white night, and this time, 
it wouldn't be a rehearsal. In November of 1978, Congressman Leo Ryan led a group to Jonestown to investigate allegations of human rights abuses. The group included the concerned relatives, Congressman Ryan's aides, a camera crew, and reporters from various newspapers. They flew out of San Francisco on November 14th to New York. After a layover of several hours, the group arrived in Guyana on November 15th. The first sign of trouble was when the group arrived at the airport. Former Temple member Grace Stowen recognized two high-level Temple members, Sharon Amos and Jim McElvain, who were standing with arms crossed, staring them down, obviously an intimidation tactic. Making it out of the airport, the group arrived at the Pegasus Hotel in Georgetown, where they found that the hotel was booked, even though they had made reservations. With the hotel clerk apologizing all over the place for the mix-up, suspicions arose that the temple had booked all the rooms. Undeterred, they decided to stay anyway. Negotiations started between the Congressional Contingent and Jonestown for permission to enter. Congressman Ryan finally said if he were refused entry, the press would record it, and it would look like Jones had something to hide. Jones caved and gave consent. Since there was limited space on the charter twin prop de Havilland Otter, some of the relatives would have to stay behind at the Hotel Pegasus in Georgetown. When the plane landed at the Port Kaituma airstrip six miles from Jonestown, they were met by Temple attorneys, Mark Lane and Charles Gary, and were informed that only Congressman Ryan and his aides would be allowed in. After a few hours, a Temple Farm tractor arrived and those remaining were told they would be taken to Jonestown. Upon arriving in Jonestown, Jim Jones hosted a reception for the delegation that evening at the Central Pavilion. Jones then gave a dissertation about the settlement's achievements while also asserting that Jonestown defectors were lying about reported abuses. He went on to claim that the U.S. government was out to destroy them. He looked unhealthy, was obsessed with death, and seemed more than a little unhinged. After the meal, Congressman Ryan went to the pavilion to address the temple followers, saying he was glad to be there, and that several people had told him that it was the best thing that ever happened to them. As the congressman walked around and interviewed the population, not one of them said that they wanted to leave. They seemed healthy and happy. The group was taken back to Port Kaituma to spend the night. While there, one of the reporters, Don Harris, informed the others that he was passed a note asking him to get them out of Jonestown. Apparently, they feared making that request publicly. Returning the next day, the group was given a tour by Jim Jones' wife, Marceline. When they requested to see what was inside of one of the buildings, their path was blocked by security. Finally, not wanting to be accused of a cover-up, the door was opened and they discovered a dormitory filled with elderly people. Cots were stacked one on top of the other like a prisoner of war camp. This was the first time they saw what they weren't supposed to see. The claim was made that cottages for these elderly women were under construction. Apparently, the younger Jonestown residents didn't have an overcrowding problem this severe. Meanwhile, tensions were rising as news spread that more and more people were telling Congressman Ryan that they wanted to leave. The number of people wanting to leave at that point were about a dozen. Ryan's delegation left on November 18th after he narrowly avoided being stabbed by Temple member Don Sly. Ryan and his delegation managed to take along 15 Temple members who expressed a desire to leave and Jones made no attempt to stop them. Jones' wife, Marceline, urged Temple members to go back to their homes after Ryan left for his plane. Aid started preparing a large metal tub with grape flavor aid, not Kool-Aid as is usually reported, poisoned with cyanide. As members of Ryan's delegation boarded two planes, the Otter and a Cessna at the Kaituma airstrip, Jonestown's Red Brigade of armed guards arrived and began shooting at them. Congressman Ryan was killed along with cameraman Bob Brown, who shot the attack footage, 
as well as San Francisco Examiner photographer Greg Robinson. Surviving the attack were Ryan A. Jackie Spear, as well as San Francisco Examiner reporter Tim Reiterman, who later wrote a book about the Jonestown Massacre, which is the book I'm using as a source for this video. Several of the Temple members escaped into the jungle. The otter was damaged, but the Cessna was able to make it out with a few passengers. Those remaining hid out waiting for the Temple members to leave, and the survivors spent the night at the airstrip. By that time, Guyanese police had arrived at the airstrip from Port Kaituma. The more seriously wounded that could not be moved were put in a military tent, and the less seriously wounded would wait for reinforcements and medical transport at a bar on the edge of Port Kaituma. The next day, more Guyanese soldiers arrived and staked out the airstrip while medical evacuation planes arrived. The group didn't know of the events that were unfolding in Georgetown. Jones received word that his security guards failed to kill all of Ryan's party and afraid the escapees would inform the United States government of the attack, he called the entire community to the Central Pavilion. He informed everyone that Congressman Ryan was dead, and it was only a matter of time before military commandos descended on their commune to kill them all. Jones ordered the group to commit revolutionary suicide and recorded the entire death ritual on audio tape. This would be Jim Jones' last white night. The temple had been receiving monthly half-pound shipments of cyanide since 1976, after Jones obtained a jeweler's license to buy the chemical. A drink mixture of Flavor-Aid and cyanide was handed out to the members of the community to drink. The children were poisoned first, the solution being squirted down their throat with a syringe by a nurse. Next, Young adults, and then the elderly, were to drink the flavor aid. The crowd was surrounded by armed guards, pushing them to drink the poison. At the end of the recording, Jones can be heard saying, We've set an example for others. One thousand people who say, We don't like the way the world is. We didn't commit suicide. We committed revolutionary suicide, protesting the conditions of an inhumane world. Were the deaths of these people painless? No. Cyanide poisoning is a painful death and can take anywhere from 5 to 20 minutes. The victim goes into convulsions. Cyanide kills because it interferes with the ability of the body to use oxygen. Guyanese pathologist Dr. Leslie Mutu was charged with examining the corpses. He said in the December 1978 inquest that a lethal dose of cyanide could kill a child in five minutes and a baby less. From what I saw, most died between 20 and 30 minutes after taking the lethal dose of cyanide poison. This is drinking rather than being dosed by a hypodermic syringe. Eighty-five members of Jonestown survived by sneaking into the jungle just as the white night ritual began. One man hid in a ditch. One elderly woman Hyacinth Thrash, hid in her dorm and hid under the bed. She either fell asleep or passed out and awoke to find that everyone had died. Temple staffers Tim and Mike Carter and Mike Prokes were given a suitcase of money containing $500,000 and instructions to transfer $7.3 million in funds to the Soviet Union from the Temple's Panamanian and Venezuelan bank accounts. The Carter brothers and Prokes were to deliver the suitcase and the letter with the instructions to the Soviet embassy in Georgetown. This assignment saved their lives. The trio were arrested in Port Kaituma. The mass murder-suicide resulted in the deaths of 909 inhabitants of Jonestown, 276 of them children, mostly in and around the Central Pavilion. Jones was found dead in his deck chair on the stage of the Central Pavilion, his head resting on a pillow with a gunshot wound to his head. It's unknown if Jones shot himself or had someone else do it. His wife Marceline had taken the poison and was lying with the people of the congregation.
Joan staffer Annie Moore was also shot. Meanwhile, back in Georgetown, Joan's son Stephen received word from radio operator Sharon Amos that the Temple basketball team was supposed to get knives and go out and kill Temple enemies. Jim Jones told Amos to please take care of everyone. He wanted all the enemies of the Temple dead and wanted those left in San Francisco to kill themselves, which amounted to 200 people. Stephen Jones and the rest of the basketball team decided they weren't going to be a part of this and went back to the Pegasus Hotel. After Stephen Jones left, Sharon Amos carried out her part of the White Knight ritual and slit the throat of her two children and then killed herself. Her last words were, Thank you, Father. Jim Jones took the concept of revolutionary suicide from Huey Newton, the head of the Black Panther Party who came up with the concept in the 1960s. Newton maintained that when you challenge the system, stand up to oppression, you may die at the hands of your oppressor. However, the movement would continue because the next person would pick up the cause and keep going. That person may be killed as well as would be any revolutionaries that followed. Then finally, the successors of early revolutionaries would reach freedom from oppression. This isn't what Jim Jones actually followed. In revolutionary suicide, the movement continues on with the successors. There were no successors in line to the Jones movement, nor was there any indication that he had planned for that. Revolutionary suicide is supposed to be part of a movement and is voluntary. Nowhere in Newton's revolutionary suicide was there squirting poison down babies' throats with a syringe. In the case of Jonestown, a good number of the deaths were murder. The People's Temple started out as a group of socialists whose mission was to do good works, which included inclusiveness, egalitarianism, and the elimination of racism. At the beginning, the People's Temple really did do good works, but as its founder and leader became more twisted and publicity-hungry, the end started to justify the means. As Joan's ego and narcissism grew, along with it grew widespread abuse. Jones increased his control by manipulation, and his dream society of socialism and communalism morphed into an authoritarian regime. Jones grew his congregation by targeting people's weaknesses and idealism and speaking as if he was one of them. He took final control by cutting them off from everyone, society, the U.S. government, and even their families. When the members of Jones' congregation ceded their assets to the temple, many of them couldn't have left even if they wanted to, as they had nothing left. In the end, Jim Jones created his own reality the way he wanted to see it and was nothing more than an unhinged leader of a cult. After Jim Jones' final white night, there were still about 80 members of the People's Temple left alive in Guyana out of the over 900 that died. Twenty-two of them were held by local police and were housed in the Parkview Hotel in Georgetown. The people held would include members of the Parks family who had defected and joined Congressman Ryan's group. All of the Parks family, with the exception of Patricia Parks, escaped the ambush at the airstrip. There were those like Odell Rhodes who were able to escape into the jungle when the final white night began. Some of the 22 would be branded loyalists by some of the others and weren't trusted. This included Tim and Mike Carter and Mike Crokes, who left Jonestown with a suitcase full of money, letters, and documents. Suspicion among the groups was rampant, and those who were among the injured as well as family members weren't happy about being held along with the Carter brothers and Crokes, who they didn't trust. The other 46 remained under guard at Lamaha Gardens, the People's Temple headquarters in Georgetown, under heavy military guard. This included those that were injured, as well as 12 members of the Jonestown basketball team, three of whom were Jones' sons, Stephen, Jim Jr., and Tim. Some handled public relations for Jones and were considered to be Jones' closest allies. 
Another was Paula Adams, chief of Temple Public Relations for the Temple. One, former Marine Charles Bikeman, was arrested and charged with the murder of Sharon Amos and her three daughters, who were found at the Lamaha Gardens house with their throats cut. Larry Layton was taken into custody at the Port Kaituma airstrip and was charged with the murders of Congressman Leo Ryan, three newsmen, and a Jonestown defector. It was alleged that he was in the company of four to six other gunmen when the congressman's party was attacked. The elderly survivors were the first to be allowed to leave by the Guyanese government because they were the easiest to clear of involvement in any illegal activities. It would be months before everyone would be cleared to leave. Guyanese pathologist Dr. Leslie Mutu was one of the first on the scene at Jonestown. The bodies were arranged in rows on the ground and were rapidly decomposing because of the tropical heat, rain, and swarms of insects. Some were so decomposed that the U.S. military cleanup crew used snow shovels to pick them up and wore face masks to block the stench. Upon examination, Dr. Mutu found puncture marks on some of the bodies, indicating that they had been injected. These marks were between the shoulder blades and the back of the arms, indicating that they were probably not suicide victims. Babies and children had been dosed by mouth syringe, and syringes were found near the bodies. Both Jim Jones and his aide, Annie Moore, had gunshot wounds to the head. At first, the United States tried to have the bodies buried at Jonestown and offered to pay for it, but the Guyanese government rejected that idea and viewed it as an American problem. Also, family in the United States wanted their relatives back. The U.S. military was then given the assignment of recovering the 918 bodies at Jonestown, with Dover Air Force Base in Delaware receiving the bodies. The Jonestown Massacre was the largest loss of American civilian life before 9-11. When the military arrived, workers would see three to four babies in body bags, which caused them to lose sleep at night. Some were angry at having to recover bodies of fanatics, while others experienced a feeling of needing to care more about human beings. Patricia Edwards, who managed logistics at Dover Air Force Base back then, said that the one thing she will never forget is the stench of the bodies. Metal caskets were shipped from Dover to Jonestown in which to place the recovered bodies. The first plane load of 40 bodies arrived at Dover Air Force Base on November 23, 1978. When the bodies arrived, they were taken to the base mortuary for identification and were stored in Hangar 1301. The metal caskets were then disinfected with chemicals mixed with steam and sent back to Jonestown for reuse. By April of 1979, around 300 bodies had been claimed by relatives. 500 remained unclaimed, and 200 had decomposed so badly that they couldn't be identified. Some family members couldn't afford the military's transport fees, around $500 in 1979 dollars. No cemetery wanted the remains at first, as they didn't want to become a pilgrimage site for the People's Temple followers that were left, as well as the curious. Eventually, an Oakland cemetery agreed to inter around 100 of the remains. Today, there is a memorial to the victims of Jonestown in Oakland, where survivors and families can gather. And Hangar 1301? It's the only building that remains from the Jonestown time period and is now the Air Mobility and Command Museum. After the mass murder-suicides, there was still some concern that some Temple survivors would undertake the final orders that Jim Jones sent to Sharon Amos in Georgetown. Rumors were rampant that there was a secret hit squad out to get Temple enemies. Guyanese soldiers kept Stephen Jones, Jim Jones Jr., and Tim Jones under house arrest for five days, interrogating them about their involvement in the Jonestown deaths. Back in San Francisco, Former Temple members asked for police protection from Temple members still there. By the same token, San Francisco Temple members feared for their lives from family members of those that died in Jonestown. The Temple was now a movement that was rudderless and leaderless. 
The temple was besieged by the media and grieving family members. For days, protesters hung outside the San Francisco temple. The events at Jonestown were subject to extensive media coverage and became known as the Jonestown Massacre. In the end, there were no hit squads, no people taking revenge, only political supporters of the temple trying to explain themselves. San Francisco Mayor George Moscone called the friends and families of many of the victims to apologize and offer his sympathies. Investigations into the Jonestown Massacre were conducted by the FBI and the United States Congress. Although information was provided to the FBI about the People's Temple, no investigation was ever done before the massacre occurred. The investigation primarily focused on why authorities, especially in the United States State Department, were unaware of the abuses in Jonestown. Leo Ryan's congressional aide and future congresswoman, Jackie Speer, continued to push for investigations into the government's response to Jonestown. Although People's Temple collapsed shortly after the events of 1978, some individuals continued to follow Jones's teachings of communalism during the 1980s. Jim Jones and the events at Jonestown had an influence on society's perception of cults. The expression, drinking the Kool-Aid, became common after the events at Jonestown, although the specific beverage used at the massacre was Flavor-Aid. The People's Temple finances were always shrouded in mystery. Jim Jones wanted to keep up the appearance of a poor organization whose mission was donating money to worthy causes. The rank and file in the congregation were never aware of the true extent of the financial assets the temple possessed. Only those in Jones' inner circle were aware of the true extent of the temple's wealth. During the exodus from California to Guyana, the temple opened foreign bank accounts so that they could conduct business in Guyana throughout the world. When he left San Francisco, Jones sold off all his U.S. assets and moved his funds overseas. This amounted to $10 million. The banking center of the temple was in Panama because of the loose banking laws of that country. The People's Temple secretary made arrangements for $7.3 million to be transferred to the Soviet embassy in Guyana. Most of the money was held in foreign bank accounts and was transferred electronically, but $680,000 was held in cash. The Soviet embassy in Guyana acknowledged that it received money from the People's Temple and turned a packet of money amounting to $34,800 over to the Protocol Division of Guyana's Foreign Ministry. The packet also reportedly contained letters, tapes, and documents. At the coroner's inquest, Cecil A. Roberts, Guyana's Assistant Commissioner of Crime, testified that the letter seized stated that assets in the amount of more than $7 million were to be bequeathed to the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. Behind the facade of religion, Jim Jones led his cult into radical Marxism and at the time of the massacre was actively exploring the possibility of moving his commune to the Soviet Union. The United States Justice Department eventually located more than $10 million deposited in banks in Panama and took steps to freeze the money, which is believed to represent the bulk of the People's Temple assets. The United States government sought to recover $3.5 million that was spent in removing the bodies of the victims from Guyana and transporting them back to the United States. Hundreds of millions of dollars in claims were placed against the assets of the People's Temple by the families of those slain in the Ryan Congressional Party. The official autopsy conducted by the Guyanese coroner confirmed Jones' cause of death as suicide, but there have always been questions about this. His son Stephen thought that his father may have directed someone else to shoot him. According to journalist Tim Reiterman, the position of Jones' body suggests that someone else may have shot him, maybe a staffer. There have always been questions about who fired the shot, Jones or someone else. A member of Jones' inner circle, Annie Moore, shot herself so she may have shot Jones, arranged his body in his chair, put his head on a pillow, 
and then shot herself. The weapon that killed Jones was 20 feet from his body. After his death, Jones' body was cremated, and his remains were scattered in the Atlantic Ocean. In 1946, Jones met Marceline Baldwin at Reed Memorial Hospital in Richmond, Indiana, where he worked as an orderly, and she was finishing up her nurse's training. Despite the fact that she was older than him and ignoring her parents' misgivings, they married in 1949. In spite of Jones morphing from charming and courteous defender of the downtrodden into self-absorbed narcissistic paranoia and serial philanderer, she stuck with him to the end. Marceline gave instructions in a signed note that Jim Jones' assets were to be given to the Communist Party of the Soviet Union. She drank the cyanide-laced flavor aid and died at Jonestown with the rest of the congregation. Lynetta Jones followed her son when he moved from Indianapolis to Ukiah, California. She was never much of a churchgoer, but while in Ukiah, worked with a local senior citizens group. When Jones relocated to Jonestown in 1977, she went with him. Because she was a heavy smoker, she had emphysema, which continued to get worse. She died of a stroke in December of 1977 and was buried next to Jones' house in Guyana. According to Find a Grave, she is buried next to her husband in Indiana. Find a Grave also has a marker that appears to be in Guyana, so I'm not sure where she's buried. The person that owns the plot can legally have a marker without a body if they pay for it. This type of marker is called a cenotaph. Since these markers are all rights reserved copyright images, I can't use them, but you can go to findagrave.com and look her up if you want to see the images. Jim Jones' father, Jim Sr., died in 1951 in Lynn, Indiana at the age of 63 and never lived to see how his son's life unfolded. He had been in poor health since his return from World War I. Jim Sr. is buried at Mount Zion Cemetery in Winchester, Indiana. Stephen Jones, born in Indianapolis, Indiana, was the only biological child of Jim and Marceline Jones. He was six years old when his family moved to Ukiah, California, and 16 when he moved to the Temple Building in San Francisco. Later, he was sent on an agricultural mission to Guyana and was 19 when the Jonestown Massacre occurred. When his father arrived in Guyana in 1977, Stephen Jones was part of the Jonestown security team, watching over Temple members and planning escape routes in case of attack by whoever his father thought was going to attack them from the outside on any particular day. During the mass murder-suicides in Jonestown, Stephen was in Georgetown with the People's Temple basketball team, which included his brothers, Jim Jr. and Tim, playing the Guyanese national team. After the game, Stephen had gone to the movies when his brother Tim told him to go back to Lamaha Gardens, the neighborhood in Georgetown where the People's Temple maintained its headquarters. The Temple radio operator, Sharon Amos, was informed that something was happening back in Jonestown and that Stephen was to take a knife and start killing Temple enemies, an order that he ignored. After the murder-suicides in Jonestown, Stephen Jones was questioned and held in a Guyanese jail for three months until the authorities could determine who had killed Sharon Amos. He was cleared of any involvement. Afterwards, he moved back to San Francisco and returned to school. He had difficulty coping and abused drugs and exercised excessively. He went to the California Historical Society and tried to identify as many people as possible in the photos of Jonestown. In that, he said he found healing. He and his wife, Christy, have three daughters. He works in the office furniture installation business in San Francisco. Jim Jones Jr. was one of Jim and Marceline Jones' adopted sons. He was in Georgetown with the Jonestown basketball team, which included his brothers Stephen and Tim, during the Jonestown Massacre. Unfortunately, his wife, 
pregnant at the time, stayed in Jonestown and died there. After returning to the United States, Jim Jr. was placed under police surveillance for several months while he lived with his older sister, Suzanne, who had previously turned against the temple. Since then, he has built a new life, remarrying and raising three sons with his wife, Erin. One of Joan's sons, Rob, played basketball in high school and went on to play in college. Jim Jr. took a lead role in the 40th Jonestown Anniversary Memorial that was held at Oakland's Evergreen Cemetery, where remains of unclaimed and unidentified victims are buried. Four granite slabs are etched with the names of the 918 people who died in Guyana, including, surprisingly enough, James Warren Jones. This isn't popular with some of the family members whose loved ones died in Jonestown. Terry Buford was a 19-year-old homeless hitchhiker escaping an abusive home life when she joined the People's Temple in San Francisco. She was a member of the temple for seven years, splitting her time between the San Francisco Temple and Jonestown. She eventually was in Jones' inner circle of people who dealt with temple finances. When the move was made to Guyana, she helped to open foreign bank accounts to handle temple finances. She was also responsible for changing bank account numbers when Debbie Blakey, another high up involved in temple finances, defected. Buford herself would defect in 1978, just three weeks before the mass murder suicides. A true believer, she had pretty much decided that Jones had changed, and not for the better. When she decided to jump ship, Buford managed to get a transfer back to San Francisco and she never returned to Jonestown. This defection caused quite a bit of consternation, as Buford, being in the Temple Finance Group, knew where the financial skeletons were buried. After Buford got back to San Francisco, she moved on to Washington, D.C., where she started a new life under the name Kim Jackson. She worked as a copy editor in New York, and then moved on to Massachusetts, helping people with disabilities. She was hospitalized a number of times for emotional breakdowns, one time lasting for months. She avoided talking about the temple for 30 years and finally contacted other temple survivors. She wrote a book of poems called Jonestown Lullaby, Poems and Pictures, that can be purchased on Amazon. She died November 28, 2018, at age 66. She is survived by a daughter, Vita. Born in Davis County, North Carolina, Archie Iams, a sharecropper's son, was one of the first members of Jim Jones' People's Temple, joining in 1956 when it was still in Indianapolis. He was a minister at Disciples of Christ and became enamored with Jones' preaching of racial integration. Jones appointed Iams to assistant pastor of the People's Temple, causing him to become the temple's highest-ranking black man. It began to become obvious to Iams over time that Jim Jones was using him as a racial token. Iams started out supervising the initial Guyana settlement, but left Guyana after Jones replaced him. He returned to San Francisco to lead the temple headquarters there. After the Jonestown Massacre, Iams left People's Temple and established friendships with some temple defectors and former temple critics. He remained committed to temple-style communalism and helping his fellow man. Archie lost his daughter, Anita, during the Jonestown Massacre. His wife, Rosie, died in 1984. He spent the rest of his life living alone in a trailer, distributing food to the poor. He never let bitterness over Jim Jones change his mission to help those in need. Iams died in 1993 at the age of 79. Tim and Mike Carter were brothers who ended up with a People's Temple assignment that saved their lives. 20-year-old Mike Carter was the radio operator for Jonestown. His older brother, 30-year-old Tim, a former Marine and Vietnam vet, worked temple security. The Carter brothers, along with Mike Prokes, were given a suitcase full of money, letters, and documents, 
to take to the Soviet embassy in Georgetown by Jones aide Maria Katsaras. They left on their assignment, and Jim Jones called his final and deadly white night. After being picked up by authorities, the brothers were taken back to Jonestown to help identify bodies and were held for questioning. After an official inquest, both escaped prosecution. Tim Carter lost wife Gloria and son Malcolm, age one, in Jonestown. After Jonestown, the brothers moved to Boise, Idaho, where Mike got a job repairing office equipment and Tim started work for a travel agency. Larry Layton was the son of a biochemist whose parents were Quakers. Layton was drawn to the hip scene in the San Francisco area of the 1960s. His older two siblings went into the sciences like their father, but Larry didn't follow them. He got involved in the anti-war movement and at a draft card burning rally met Carolyn Moore, the daughter of activists. Layton and Moore were married in 1967. Carolyn, a good student, finished her degree, and obtained her teaching certificate. While Carolyn worked to support them, Larry finished his undergraduate studies and was trying to avoid the draft by becoming a conscientious objector, using his Quaker background. When the Laytons joined the People's Temple, they knew little of the Temple's history and were attracted by the inclusiveness and social conscience of the Church. Larry also had a drug problem and was going through rehab inside the church. Layton and his wife Carolyn became members of Jim Jones' inner circle. After Carolyn became Jim Jones' mistress, they separated and later divorced. When Congressman Ryan's congressional group arrived in Jonestown, Layton told the Ryan contingent that he wanted to leave with them. When the group reached the airstrip, Layton opened fire on the occupants of a Cessna that contained defectors, wounding two people. The gun was taken from Layton, and he was turned over to Guyanese police. Acquitted in Guyana, he was then turned over to the U.S. government to be tried for conspiracy to commit murder. After a mistrial, Layton was convicted and sentenced to prison in 1987. He was paroled in 2002. Charles Beichman, an illiterate ex-Marine from Indianapolis, Indiana, was one of only two people, the other being Larry Layton, who were charged in connection with events in Georgetown. Beichman had been a member of the Temple since 1972 and served as the Temple handyman. He was present when Sharon Amos slit the throat of her daughters and then killed herself at the Temple headquarters in Georgetown when Jim Jones called his final white night. Beichman pled guilty to the attempted murder of Stephanie Jones. Amos ordered Beichman to slash Stephanie's throat, but he only made a superficial cut, so Stephanie survived. Beichman served five years in a Guyana prison and was released in 1983. While in prison, he was a model prisoner and learned shoemaking as well as learning to read. After his release, he told reporters that he wanted to stay in Guyana but the authorities weren't up with that idea. He returned home to Indiana and moved in with his brother Dale. He died in 2001. Bikeman's wife Becky and son Ronald died in Jonestown. His son Thomas was in Georgetown getting treatment for a broken arm during the massacre and survived. While his father was in prison, Thomas returned to the United States and lived with his uncles. Paula Adams was a 22-year-old mixed-up woman with no hope beyond the drinking, doping life of a manic depressive when she joined the People's Temple. A member of Jim Jones' inner circle and Temple publicist, Adams was in Georgetown during the mass suicides in Jonestown so escaped the carnage. She was one of the first people sent to Guyana by Jones. Married to Tom Adams when she first joined the church, she and her husband separated when they lived in San Francisco and divorced in 1979. When she was in Guyana, she fell in love with a married Guyanese ambassador to the United States, Lawrence Mann. After the massacre, Mann was angry with Jones and felt that Paula had been used by him. Adams and Mann left Guyana and came to the United States, settling in the Washington area in 1980 where Paula worked at the computer firm Libra Technologies. 
She lived in Bethesda, Maryland, in a two-bedroom apartment with her son Alexander, her son by man. At the time, Mann was still married to his third wife, who was living in Trinidad and had three other children from his previous marriages. Adams and Mann had a tempestuous relationship, and Mann had once threatened her with a gun. She was trying to extricate herself from the relationship, but still wanted Alexander to have a relationship with his father. On October 23, 1983, Mann came to her apartment and shot her, Alexander, and then himself. Adam's niece was in another room and was unharmed. Mike Prokes was born in Cleveland, Ohio, and grew up in Modesto, California. He graduated from Cal State Fullerton and went to work for KXTV News in Stockton, eventually rising to bureau chief. He came in contact with Jim Jones when he was assigned to do a story about the People's Temple. Afterwards, he quit his journalism position and became Jones' public relations officer. Prokes avoided the mass murder-suicides because he was assigned, along with the Carter brothers, to deliver a suitcase full of money to the Soviet embassy in Georgetown. The three were later arrested by the Guyanese authorities. He was eventually released and returned to Modesto, California. Several months later, Prokes called a press conference where he praised Jim Jones and tried to explain the actions of the people of Jonestown. He then excused himself, went to the bathroom, and shot himself. Hyacinth Thrash, a lifelong Baptist, was 52 when she and her sister, Zipporah, joined the People's Temple when Jones had his temple in Indianapolis. Hyacinth was attracted to Jones' interracial inclusiveness, something that was rare in Indianapolis back in the late 1950s. She also believed in his powers of faith healing and was convinced until the day she died that he had cured her breast cancer. Hyacinth and Zipporah followed Jones when he moved to California in 1965. They bought a house and turned it into a Temple-run senior center. Temple lawyer Tim Stowen and Jones convinced her to sell the house and give the money to the church. The proceeds were $35,000. When Jones moved to Guyana, Hyacinth and Zipporah went with him. Hyacinth started to have misgivings about the temple, believing that it had turned into a cult and Jones a dictator. She and her sister like other temple members, were stuck in Guyana with no means of support. Hyacinth hid under her bed in the elderly person's dormitory when Jones called his final white night. While hiding, she fell asleep or passed out and awoke to find everyone dead. She spent the day among the dead bodies and was finally rescued. Her sister Zip died in the massacre. Hyacinth returned to Indianapolis in 1982 and lived in the Mount Zion Geriatric Center. She also wrote a book about her Jonestown experiences titled The Onlyest One Alive. She died in 1995 at age 90.
This concludes the second part of my video series, Serial Killers and Cults. This project is turning into a marathon instead of a sprint, as making these things is taking a little longer than I expected. No, actually a lot longer. Please remember to like, subscribe, and ring that notification bell so you can keep up to date on future videos.